So welcome everybody to the lightning talk session here at Sotom 2019. We have four speaker and we'll hear about post boxes, addresses, um, OSM inspector and um, about bus lines. So we start with uh, SK53 and hear about post boxes. Okay, my name's Jerry Clough, best known as SK53. Um, I'm ostensibly going to talk about post boxes, but it's really about tagging. Uh, we hear we hear every few weeks or every few months on the mailing list, tagging is broken, it needs to be replaced by a formal model. I thought I'd just look at those implications by looking at one of the most mundane things we map, a simple bit of street furniture, the post box. Also happens to be a sort of cultural meme in OSM that we map post boxes. Um, the first thing to say, when we, look, when we say amenity equals post box, we're already muddling concepts. We're talking about two things. We're talking about a physical lump of metal stuck in a place on the street, the item of street furniture, and we're talking about a service where a postal company comes and takes your, the letters you put in the post box. I won't touch on the fact that also in many languages the word for post box is the same as the word we use for the place where the postal service sent gives you the letters. This post box is interesting because it's uh, the only way we map the physical post box is when we say it's a disused colon amenity equals post box like this one, which also happens to be very interesting because it was attacked by suffragettes in about 1911 in a protest for votes for women. So it turns out post boxes have, and there's an interesting history of post box violence, and that isn't the first example. The, the, main, thing, the main thing we I think the way we are using post boxes is as the service. And Really, we know where the post box is, that's the most important thing, and maybe the collection times are useful to add. Most, in most things, you have a cultural idea of when the post comes to collect. You know, it used to be 4 o'clock to 6 o'clock in the evening in Britain, but now it's usually 9 o'clock in the morning. So. so, the next kind of tagging is describing what kind of post box, and typically we have three kinds of post boxes, and here I've got a Polish uh, lamp, box attached to a wall, a wall box which is mounted in the wall, so it's not, you only have a plate, and a German pillar box. If we look at the post box as a whole, this is the typical anatomy of a British post box. Um, there's a little thing here saying when the next collection time is, which we, I don't think anyone maps where that exists. Then we have Below, we have the hole where you put the letters. And I don't know if you know, but some letter boxes, post boxes have more than one hole. So you can say post box apertures equals two. Um, beneath that, you have the collection plate, where first of all, we have all the information which we put into um, the opening times. And anyone who's looked at the opening, the, the opening times specification understands that's a really complex semi-formal specification with lots of holes. Um, and then a couple of things which you notice on British post boxes. Beneath that, you will see uh, a crown. And beneath that, the initials of the Queen, which is the royal cipher. And beneath that, it says post office. And most postal companies will have some kind of logo associated with the post box. I don't know if it's visible on this one. But also sometimes, these are, if these are made of cast metal, they have the name of the manufacturer and we can tag post box and colon manufacturer equals so on. We can get a bit more complicated. There are hundreds of different designs of pillar boxes, so we can say post box colon design equals so on. And these are, I'm afraid I'm very, this is a very, UK-centric, but I'm sure you recognize that some of the same issues exist in uh, other countries. Royal ciphers. We have a, a range of six royal ciphers available. This is the royal cipher of Edward VIII, which, because he was the king for only eight months, is very rare and therefore 
are very select and dedicated. People go and do these things. And you can read more about these on the wiki. But Queen Elizabeth II is only the queen, number two Queen Elizabeth in England, Wales, and Northern Ireland. She is Queen Elizabeth in Scotland. And that was regarded as unacceptable to the point that people blew up post boxes with <laughs> E2R on. And you can read more about that on the Pillar Box War page on Wikipedia. And in a typical British compromise, um, they introduced uh, the Scottish crown, which you will notice is different from the crown we saw on the previous one, which is the imperial crown onto the post box. Yeah, okay. Is it just a British issue? No. Here's an Irish post box with a royal cipher. We also have colour. They come in lots of different colours, and these are all in Windsor. Oops, where's it gone? We have gold post boxes which are associated with Olympians and Paralympians. We have post boxes which are listed buildings and also telephone kiosks. And this is the complete range of tags on post boxes, including the UK on Robert Whittaker's post, post, post box side. If we tried to represent all of that with a formal method, we'd be talking about orders of magnitude complexity of stuff we could never verify. Tagging isn't broke, don't fix it. Thank you. Hey, thanks a lot. So I click here too, okay. So my name is Thierry, I'm French, but I've been uh, for, in Brazil for more than 20 years. And I came to, to, to OpenStreetMap with Telenav when I was the country manager for Telenav in Brazil. And uh, when they told me, hey, try to, do what, to see what you can do for the community in Brazil, uh, I, didn't, I, didn't do the, I didn't do much um, mapping, but I started doing what I was used to do, is to get in contact with people, and that was in 2014, 2015. So I managed to have a, I had, I've had quite many meetings with many different people in Brazil, uh, particularly in governments. The governments even published an official note recommending the use of OpenStreetMap to uh, Brazilian governments in general. And uh, among all these contacts that I've had, uh, I, I always speak in my presentation at one moment, I always speak about Willy, who is also from Brazil, but uh, who is, develops the, the, the USM SHA. And uh, in 2014, I saw this presentation from uh, Christian Quest, who is not here anymore today because he left yesterday, was with us. And I was very much impressed by what he managed to do in France. Um, he said to the, Ministry of, uh, to the Ministry of Finance, hey, uh, we OpenStreetMap have got a set of addresses, you've got another one, which is very good. Uh, L'Institut Géographie Nationale has got another one, and the post office has got four different ones, and many people are sending addresses here in France. Why don't we put all our efforts together uh, in one place? And after a while, in fact, he managed to, he managed to do that, because uh, if, if there was a very interesting fight, a kind of a fight or a problem because the, between the, EG, the IGN and his project, because his project was kind of an open project. And finally, it seems that the first minister created, I, I'm not 100% sure of this story, but the first minister created um, Etalab, which, was, which, is, which, still, is, is, which is still an, an entity that um, works for digitalization of the government in France. And they invited him to coordinate this project uh, from inside, from the government side. And I found it very interesting. So there is a, a, a website that exists in France, which is address.data.gov.ifr, and they are working on uh, congregating and bringing together all these different 
data sets of addresses focused on addresses from municipalities, utility players, etc. And it's a project which is going on uh, reasonably well. Although Christian Quest uh, just left it recently, but there is someone, there are some other people there taking care of the project. And it's a very cheap project. It's a, it's a project that could be um, uh, done with about two or three people, and that's all. Because it's, it basically it's a database, and where you need to invite people to, 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 um, uh, to communicate and to give data, etc. So I've tried to do that in Brazil, and I'm proposing with all these meetings, um, um, among these pictures that I've shown before of, of meetings that I had, I had meetings with people from the digital secretary of uh, the digital government in Brazil, with the IBGE, which is the uh, the, 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 the entity that is doing uh, geography and, and, and maps in Brazil. I've, sp I've spoken with the uh, Brazilian Association of uh, Logistics, etc. And what I'm, I'm explaining to them is that Brazil has got no uh, address or no good set of addresses uh, in, in OpenStreetMap. The best player is probably Google today after here and TomTom, Tom, but it, geocoding in Brazil is, a very, is an actual challenge when you get out of the big towns. And it's an enormous opportunity for the country to improve its logistics. And I tell them, hey, every time I speak with someone who has got, for example, a fleet, uh, how many? One minute. A fleet, for example. Uh, how, in how much would you improve your, 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 your logistics and your operation if you had a good set of addresses? And the guys say, well, I don't know, at least 5%. And it happens that Brazil spends something like 12% of, of its gross national product in, uh, on logistics. So the potential of having just a database is enormous in terms of improvement of the, of, of the functioning of the country. So uh, I'm, I'm trying to evolve, and, and, and it seems to me that as I've worked on this in the last month more, more precisely, it seems to me that I'm about to, to manage to do it. And I think that it's very interesting for, as a conclusion, I think this project in France is amazingly interesting. It's very interesting if we manage to do it in Brazil, and I think it would be very interesting to know eventually, eventually other places uh, in the world interested in trying to work on that or where people would have already done that. So I'm interested in, instead of only speaking about France, to speak eventually of uh, uh, other places with, where similar things, things have been done. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your talk. Yes. So next person is Nakana, Michael Reichert, and he will tell us news about OSM Inspector, let's see. Put away this Google advertisement, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the stage is yours, Nakana. Hello, I'm, I'm Nakana from Geofabric. I am currently the, the main developer of OpenStreetMap Inspector, and I would like to show you some news about the OpenStreetMap Inspector in the last couple of months. Um, we have rewritten the routing view. The routing view was previously based off a couple of back-end programs. It used OSRM to detect routing islands, sinks, and sources, and a Java program by Pascal Nice to find unconnected nodes. We've rewritten this part and um, now use a graph hopper based software to find unconnected nodes, routing islands, and duplicated edges. This is Heidelberg. It looks quite uh, bad, but um, a lots of them are false duplicates, and I would like to show you some of the layers as a first step. Um, there is the group duplicated edges. The duplicated edges group uh, con uh, distinguishes between um, real duplicated edges and those which are just false, likely false positives near pedestrian areas. Um, let's have a look at this one. Click on it, and then you have a button where you can open it in JOSM. And Let's have a look. It seems that there are two, edges, two ways above each other, and I can have a look at the differences, and it seems that someone has 
uh, torn um, the way above the other one. So the solution would usually be to delete, to delete one of them. Sometimes this is an accident of splitting ways. So that would be the solution, and it looks fine. Let's have a look at the next layer group. Um, islands. Islands are locations in, on the routing graph which are not connected to the rest of the graph. Um, routing engines are usually able to eliminate them um, before they, um, during the pre-processing, but they are usually a sign of somehow broken data. For example, let's have a look at this one. It's black, it means that um, this is a routing island for all vehicles, not only cars and bicycles. The car and bicycle layers take access restrictions into account while the all vehicle layers layer doesn't. This is a bridge over a road and it's not connected anywhere and it's in private way. Um, the best solution would be to visit the location and try to connect it to the road network. That's something you can't usually do with aerial imagery only. The third group of layers are um, unconnected nodes. Um, the color means, uh, the color is an indicator of the importance of the error. Red is real, a real issue, while blue is often a false positive. Um, this ranking takes the distance into account, and it takes to, into account whether there are um, texts like no exit equals yes or entrance equals yes at the end node, and it will discard all unconnected ends where the next way is beyond a fence or embankment or wall, which you cannot pass. For example, this arrow here is of medium priority, and it's a leftover of incomplete sidewalk mapping. It's likely that these sidewalks are, should be connected to the road. The road is ending here, and the best solution would be to press A and connect them. Thank you for your attention. So we are talking about quickly mapping bus lines and how it works with counting tools. That's my, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. So I'm sorry, my handwriting is terrible. It's with uh, routing tools. Ah, I um, was yeah, what well, would you count? Um, and I realize I'm the last one standing between us and lunch, so I'll be very quick. Um, hopefully, we can still get something today. And how do you do this? A view and full screen mode. Mm -hmm. That looks good. So I've, uh, I've mapped a couple of uh, bus lines with uh, the PTV2 schema. For those who've done it, it takes a long time. You have to put every way in the thing, and it breaks often people, uh, create gaps and, by mistake. And uh, so it's a fragile, um, complex schema. What I've done is I, I put a tool that, uh, where you copy-paste from a relation, you put all the stop positions of a, of a line, you just have to gather those in the right order, and then you uh, click on that, on that button, and it uh, opens up uh, OSRM with a bus profile, so it does all the, all the way that the bus would take. If there's a mistake, you could grab the line and, and drag it along to, the, to where the bus is supposed to run. And uh, it also lets you know, where, it also lets you detect when the, when the tagging, when like a one-way bus is, is missing. Um, so you can improve OSM. And then um, for those who have very good eyes, you see at the bottom left, but I, I've, I've zoomed in for you. I've created a button that says uh, create relation in JOSM. And um, when you do that, in the background, it takes, uh, so OSRM doesn't return way ideas, but it returns nodes. So it takes all those nodes, IDs, and then it, uh, using uh, the Mapbox roots annotator, it gets the 
way IDs from that. So if you're going through node 123 and 234, you must be going through that way. And it takes all of those ways and it tells JOSSIM to fetch them from overpass and to create a relation containing all those ways. And you get uh, this, which is uh, in a few minutes, you've made a whole bus relation containing all the ways that the bus is going to go through. Uh, it's not perfect. I've taken the screenshot showing how it's not perfect. It has a, a gap at the bottom, but then you would just use the the PT assistant tools to fix the gaps uh, half automatically, or you'd fix it manually because it doesn't take a lot of time. And you would add the tagging and you would uh, paste the stops uh, into that relation and that's it. You have your PTV2 root. Uh, and while I was doing that, I thought, you know, um, why are we even um, entering the, all the ways into OSM? Um, because what we can define uh, a bus route as is um, stops and also the um, via points that sometimes you would have to take for special cases. But most of the time, the stops are enough. So I'm thinking of making a proposal, and uh, this is to get everyone screaming at me, no, this is not a good idea, um, of redefining bus lines as uh, just the stops and via points. Um, <coughs> Next step are also, um, with this matching, I could also do, you know, often you get open, da open data from, oh, there's a hiking route. And you take that, and uh, with this, you can turn it into the ways and build a relation like that uh, far more easily than adding every single way in JOSM or cycling as well. Route relations in general. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Guillaume.